asking me who is the best bespoke shoemaker in the world, it's like a torture to me. First of all, because you probably know if you read a Parisian Gentleman, we are online since nine years, if you've read one of my books, that I'm the grandson of a bootmaker myself. My grandfather was making high boots for equestrian, so I'm pretty much born into that area. But I will give you, of course, a few names, but first of all, I will give you a few information and re-clarify once again a few concepts. What are we talking about? Because when we are talking about real bespoke shoemaking, in fact, we are talking of an extremely limited amount of people on Earth. Maybe 50 people, maximum. Because the word bespoke, it's even more critical to understand in the world of shoemaking than in a world of tailoring. In a former episode of Tutorial Talks, I explained what bespoke was. Uh, I was at Dalquare, if I remember well, and I explained the difference between make to measure and bespoke. It's very precise. In shoemaking, it's even more precise. That is to say, a real bespoke shoemaker will create what we call a last in wood. That is to say, your foot in wood on which he will draw a pattern. So, one pair of shoe, one last, one customer. Something unique strictly for you. Why do I do this uh, clarification? It's because Nowadays, some very good shoemakers, I'm not saying they're not good, but some shoemakers pretend to do bespoke. But it's not real bespoke, because they start from an existing shape, from an existing last. Yes, they will take the shape of your, of your foot. Yes, they will verify if you have a high instep or a low instep. Yes, they will measure your foot. But they will not start with a piece of wood, they will start already with a lath, which, re, which is shaped, and they will add some cork on it, or they will work on it to make it slimmer. But this is not bespoke. This is what we call made-to-measure unmodified last. So the people who are connoisseurs and passionate about shoes, and believe me, it's very easy to become obsessional about shoes because it's a fascinating world, they understand what I'm talking about. Here, if we speak about strictly bespoke, well, once again, uh, it's usual to say that three great schools of bespoke shoemaking, Great Britain, France, and Italy. But for once, I will add also that on Eastern Europe, you have fantastic school of bespoke shoemaking in Hungary, for example, and also in Romania and in countries like uh, Poland. So that's um, just to give you an overview. I'm going to give you a few names. In England, uh, I'm going to choose two names, George Cleverley and Tony Gaziano. Uh, this is the essence of uh, shoemaking, uh, bespoke shoemaking in England. Of course, you have the Lub Atelier, but it's less my taste. There last are more traditional, too traditional uh, for me. And on the other hand, Tony Gaziano. Tony Gaziano is a, is a working class hero. Tony Gaziano is, a, is probably one of the most talented shoemaker of his generation. He's a, and, and on top of that, he's a great man. He's a fantastic, as his, as his name sounds, he's not coming. He's from uh, Italian roots, Gaziano. Uh, he is working in Kettering, which is uh, close to Northampton, where all the shoemaking industry um, is located in England. Uh, the shoes of Tony Gaziano are really pieces of art, and this is real bespoke. So, in England, I would say between Cleverley and Gaziano, you touch among the best. Of course, there are many others that are extremely respectable, but this is my choice for England. Um, for Italy, that's very complicated because in Italy everything is complicated, and i explain you why. It's because uh, it's always difficult in Italy to detect what we are talking about. Because, for example, handmade, which is the essence of this book, it's handmade. Handmade and tutto fatto a mano in Italian don't have the same meaning. Even if you look at the text, 
of, uh, at the law, in France is very strict. When it's written handmade, it has to be unmade from A to Z. Tutto fatto a mano in Italy, well, if you just polish a little bit the shoe up by hand at the end, it may be considered tutto fatto a mano, all made by hand. So this is why in Italy it's kind of difficult, but I have a few uh, people that I like and they are doing the job uh, as, it, as it should be done. I'm thinking about uh, my friend Seiji Miyagawa. You would be surprised say he speaks of Italy, but he's giving a, a, a Japanese name. Seiji Miyagawa is um, the shoemaker, the bespoke shoemaker of Mario Bemer in Florence. And he's a great master. He's been trained uh, by my friend Stefan Jimenez, that I will speak of a little bit later. And this is a very good bespoke shoemaker. And I, I like him specifically because they do traditional bespoke and their price are quote unquote affordable on the market because there's something that many people uh, don't know that shoemaking at this level of craftsmanship requires so many hours, so many hours, so many fittings, so many. A real shoemaker, a real bespoke shoemaker normally should propose to you first a, tr a, a trial shoe. That is a shoe which is a, which is a real shoe but made of second uh, choice leather. This shoe is just made for, the, for, for you to feel the tension, to make sure you are at your ease in every aspect of the shoe. And then most of the time, the bespoke shoemaker will destroy it. Even if you see, what, what are you doing this? Because this shoe is beautiful. No, it's not the real shoe, it's, it's a trial shoe. You, you have to try it. So that's also something that people, not every people are doing. You know? So. Seiji Miyagawa at Mario Bemer because it's an affordable bespoke and it's a great work. I think about Antonio Meccariello in Naples, which is a kind of a new kid on the block. He was a shoemaker for Keaton back in the years. He proposed different kind of bespoke, but he can do real bespoke and he's a great talent. I'm thinking about Paolo Scafora also in Naples. They do some hand-velted, um, uh, more um, uh, ready to wear shoe, but they are very good at this book. And specifically, if you are looking for some high hand Norwegian stitching, this is very sturdy shoes. Paolo Scafora is a name to remember for sure. Uh, but there's a lot uh, Roberto Golini, uh, so many, so many, um, uh, Enzo Bonafé, there's a lot of people. But these are the names that are coming to my mind. Then we have France. And for once, the British say we invented everything in shoemaking. I, well, I don't really agree on that. Because I think that France today, it's probably one of the most, first of all, respected and alive bespoke shoemaking uh, country in the world. And there's two reasons for that. First reason is because we have this artisan guild that many of you in America or in England may not know which are called the Compagnons du Devoir, literally the Duty Companions. It's a non-profit organization uh, that is, has been created, I don't know, a few centuries ago. It's an institution in France where masters of their art, um, um, they receive uh, apprentices and they have the duty to teach them their art. And the apprentice has to do what we call a Tour de France. Literally, they do a Tour of France it can last two, three, four, five years. And they have to go from masters to, from masters, to masters to learn their craft. And at the end, so they live in companion houses, in community, it's like a community. And then they spend six months here and then one year here and to learn, to learn. And then at the end, normally it takes, let's say between three to five years, they have to create their masterpiece and to present their masterpiece to a jury of companions. So it's a brotherhood, which is unique in the world. I think there's only one country who has something a little bit different. It's in Germany, but you don't, it's unknown, except from France, which aim is to promote and protect craftsmanship in its purest form. So when you have this, of course, you have ex fantastic shoemakers that have been doing this. We had Pierre Corté, which of course was a compagnon, uh, we had Anthony Delos, which is probably was and still is 
uh, one of my favorite shoemakers in the world. That's an artist who's now at the head of the Berluti Atelier, Bespoke Atelier in Paris. Um, you have um, uh, people like Stéphane Jiménez. Very few people know about Stéphane Jiménez. Stéphane Jiménez was the head of the Stefano Bemer Atelier in Florence. He's very well known because he's, um, he's, um, he's, he's a companion, again, and um, he was the one who created the maintenance atelier for John Love in Paris. We also have in France uh, Aubercy. Aubercy is um, this story. Aubercy has a chapter of eight pages in my first book. This is a shoe store with great people, they are shoe lovers and purists. And since two years, they reopened a bespoke operation, a bespoke, real bespoke atelier, Rue Vivienne in Paris. And they have a Japanese bootmaker. Uh, that's funny because there's a lot of Japanese bootmaker all around the world, in Italy, in France, everywhere. And um, Yasuhiro Shiota, I think I pronounce his name well, we call him Yasu. Is a great shoemaker in Aubercy in Paris. That's a name also to consider and to remember because this is the real, real bespoke in shoemaking. Uh, we have also Philippe Atienza that many people don't know, which is, uh, he was at the head of Massaro one time, but now he's on his own. He's a great, great, great shoemaker. So we have fantastic shoemakers in France. So I said there's two reasons. The first reason is because of the compagnon. All those people I just quoted are compagnon from this guild and brotherhood of artisans. And the second reason is that we have the John Love Atelier in Paris. And the John Love Atelier in Paris, which is part of the Hermes group, is probably, well, this is one of the best atelier in the world. So when you have the Compagnon, this brotherhood of craftsmen and the John Love Atelier in Paris, it produces a fantastic generation of shoemakers. One thing to remember, is that people like Stéphane Jiménez, it's probably my favorite these days because this guy is such a talent. His, his, his shoes are not shoes, this is sculptures, literally. Uh, it's very difficult to make a living when you're a bespoke shoemaker. When somebody is, is investing five to 6,000 euros in a pair of shoes, believe me, there's pressure on the shoemaker. It's 60 to 80 hours by hand, different fittings, and people are very um, demanding when you invest this kind of money in a pair of shoes, they are very demanding. So it's, um, it's, 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 it's a craft that uh, it, it needs to be protected, promoted, because there are people, there's a public for that. But uh, you have to be educated. And this is, what, this is one of my quests in Parisian Gentlemen. I want to educate people to say, okay, look, you have money. Uh, you buy things that you're, gonna, you're not going to use, or you buy, you know, sometimes, I don't know, furniture or uh, cars or whatever. Why don't you buy a pair of shoes? Okay, it sounds ridiculous to put 6,000 or 10,000 in a pair of shoes, but if you understand what is behind, not only you are buying something exceptional, but you protect a craft, you protect a profession, and you, you promote people who need to be promoted. And then, as I said, you have countries which are totally unknown for this kind of craft, but I will give you a small trick, a small secret. All the countries who were formerly in the 80s on the wrong side of the wall, they were in the communist er area, Romania, Hungary, um, Poland, all these countries, um, all of them, they have a fantastic tradition of boot making. You know why? It's easy to understand. When you were in a communist country, they had, they had enormous numbers of soldiers because the biggest armies were in the communist countries. And so they needed what? They needed people to craft boots. And they were not very advanced in terms of mechanization, so most of the boots of the army were made by hand. This is why you still find incredible ateliers in Romania, for example. One of the most famous brands of the last decade for real connoisseurs. It's not exactly bespoke, it's modified glass, but made to measure strictly by hand. Beautiful house, it's called Saint Crispin. Saint Crispin is the saint of the shoemaker, actually. Saint Crispin is in Romania. So Romania is a very interesting country. Hungary, Budapest. Everybody knows Laszlo Vas. Laszlo Vas has become 
has become sorry uh, a superstar in the in, in the field of shoes recently because he's uh, from the Hungarian school. Hungary has a school. You go in Budapest, you go in the street. There's six, seven, eight bespoke shoemakers because they're still very alive and they have a lot of talent. Um, Poland, Mr. Kilman in Poland. So you have multiple things. And then last but not least, the Japanese. Well, I must admit that Japan is, a, is an amazing country in the world of men's style and specifically in shoemaking. The most daring, sophisticated, um, very like the most um, shoe that are a stylistic statement, the most original shoe that you can find nowadays in the world are from Japan, by far. You have a lot of names that many people know, but one of my favorite shots called Tai Shoemaker. It's in Tokyo. These people are incredible. They really create pieces of art. And the only problem to access a Japanese bootmaker is that Tokyo is far. They don't travel much. They do travel a little bit. Uh, but the domestic market in Japan is so big for bespoke shoemaking that they don't really need to travel. And unless you can afford you to go three or four times to Tokyo just for a pair of shoes, uh, it's, it's difficult to access. And the second thing is that the fit of the people in Asia, in China and in Japan are very different from our fit. They are very flat. And, and so the sh the, they are trained on, on fit that are very different from the Western fit. So this is why sometimes it's, it's, for example, um, the, the people from Asia, when they go to a, a bespoke shoemaker in France, in Paris, it's a nightmare because their feet are very flat. They don't have this arch that we have, European and American. That's just for the connoisseurs. And this explains why uh, the Japanese shoemaker, they don't travel much because they have a big domestic market and they craft shoes for different kinds of feet. But Japan is just a fantastic country also. So I hope I answered the question. There are many talented shoemakers in the world. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit patriotic for once. Uh, I think that the French school might be the most elegant, but it's only my opinion. Cheers. <laughs>